Red Test. Sweet. Sour. So good to test. Welcome to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Boss, your host every week for 60 Minutes of Delicious Radio and once a month, first Tuesday of every month at Green Building Supply, where we are at as of this moment. Though, of course, well, those of you on live stream, actually, it is as of this moment because Fairfield Media Center's Jason Strong is here engineering this live event. So welcome to all of you who are catching the live stream and welcome to those of you who braved the weather to come uh, because it's snowing outside, but it's not really. I mean, you know, people that I know who like live in Erie, Pennsylvania, they would just <laughs> laugh, right? When they, I mean, they would just, they just, you guys never, we never have snow based on people who live in Erie, Pennsylvania. Anyway, this is going to be a, uh, a show that I have never done actually anything like this in over 10 years of doing this show because usually I'm holding a microphone and talking to somebody else who's doing the cooking. Now I have cooked on the show before, but then I did like maybe a few minutes or, or for example, Kathy Dubois, who is my former co-host, she took the mic for a while and I cooked a little bit, but I've never actually stood here and talked and cooked for 60 minutes in over 10 years. So I guess we'll see what happens. Maybe. Hopefully it'll go okay, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, uh, part of the time you're gonna have to listen to me pontificate if you continue to listen to either the broadcast or watch the live stream. And part of the time I'm going to be making two different, I'm actually gonna be cooking because there's a difference between making pasta and cooking pasta. We're not gonna be making any pasta, we're gonna be cooking pasta. I'm gonna be cooking two different pasta dishes. And these two dishes have a very special place uh, in my uh, heart because a friend of ours passed away uh, recently. And these are two of the dishes that she would uh, enjoy having us make. And one, the second one actually has a much more detailed story and we'll get there a little bit later in the broadcast. But we're gonna start off with this very simple pasta dish, which is something that you can easily make at home. And it's one of the things that I love to talk about with people because I like people to understand so many people really don't get that it doesn't take a whole lot of time and effort to cook. People think that it's a very complicated procedure for the most part. Jason, is everything okay? Because Okay, because I'm looking at you fiddling with, <laughs> I was <just> wondering. <laughs> so it isn't. Cooking is easy. It can be complicated if you, you know, or somebody like Fernand Adria, for example, or another great chef, but you know, making, Cooking pasta is as simple as heating up some water, getting it to boil, throwing some salt in the water, throwing the pasta in, which we're gonna do right away, and having all your other stuff available. Because this pasta, even though it's a vegetable pasta, it's gonna use arugula as its main vegetable. And normally I would have a big, much bigger venue for this uh, water, but because we need the other pot for the other pasta later on. We're just gonna have to do the best we can. And if we keep it stirred well, it should be all right, we hope. Anyway, Christy, would you time this? And I, I don't know exactly, let me know when it's a couple of minutes before it should be done so that I can taste it. So that's one of the key things that you wanna do when you cook pasta, is you want to cook it till it's maybe got two minutes or so left, and then you wanna finish it off in a different pan. You want to get it to the point where it's al dente, but you want to do that in the pan so that the sauce or whatever else you're mixing in gets thoroughly heated through and it gets to be absorbed into the pasta itself and it just makes it so much more unctuous and delicious when you do it that way as opposed to cooking it till it's just right and then dumping whatever you're going to dump onto it. So as I said, we're making this particular pasta, fusilli, with arugula. And arugula is, is such a great vegetable to use if you want a quick pasta because A, there's no need to cook it. 
you, if you feel like you want it cooked a little bit, you could actually throw it into a pan with a little bit of olive oil for like 15, 20 seconds even, and then throw the uh, pasta on top of it and whatever vegetables you're gonna use, if you're gonna use anything more than arugula. Or you can just mix it in with the hot pasta and it'll cook very quickly. The arugula is very beautiful, at least, oh, yes. Here's the arugula. It's actually a very beautiful and, and it's nice and peppery, so it's, it's just a great little vegetable to use. Most people think about it for salads, but I love arugula in pasta. That's, that's the way I, love, I like it the best. And so that's just a real easy trick then to rather than having to cut up a whole bunch of vegetables and saute them and make a, uh, a nice base for them, you can just make this up really quickly. Now, how, what else are you going to need to use to give it flavor depth? Well, again, you can be as complicated or as simple as you like. This is, it's winter time, right? So there are no decent tomatoes, quite obviously. So this is a, this, these are the results. This is what comes from taking a can of Muir Glen organic tomatoes and roasting them at a very low temperature for several hours along with whatever you like. Some, a sprig of fresh rosemary, some garlic, some olive oil, uh, maybe some other herbs, and then taking a hand stick blender and blending them, blending it all up. And what you have is an extremely whew, concentrated sauce, and it acts just like a, a um, tomato paste. And so we're just gonna use a little bit of it along with some pasta water to make the sauce for this pasta. So that's how, now, if you don't wanna take the time to do that, you don't have the time to do that, then all you have to do is just open up a jar of what I would, I mean, a can of what I would rather use would be at that, if I'm not gonna do this, I'd rather open up a, a can of the crushed Muir Glen tomatoes and then add some herbs and, and some uh, garlic and, uh, do that to give it a little bit more depth and body. But meantime, another thing that we're that I did is that I made not organic pear chutney, which is what this label says, <laughs> but uh, this is Meyer lemon infused olive oil. So people, you, you know, if you go into stores, right, that you can see tons of infused olive oils on the shelves. And they're usually fairly expensive, actually. But you can make them at home, for the most part. And there's no need to, to have to spend all that money. And you can make as much or as little as you want. It's better to make a little bit because, you know, you should use like this, you should use in three or four days probably. You can make a garlic infused one that might last a lot longer, maybe a couple weeks or so. But the point is that it's really simple to do because all you have to do, like for this, all I had to do was peel a Meyer lemon. So I'm taking the, the um, citrus, the outside part, right? The, instead of zesting it, I'm actually peeling it and I'm trying to get as little white as possible when I go around and peel it. And then I heat my olive oil up, just, I'm just warming it up, right? And I'm dumping that peel in there and letting it sit in there for 10, 15, 20 minutes. It's just very warm. It's not boiling, <laughs> it's not bubbling. And one key is that you wash your lemon or your Meyer lemon or whatever very well. Matter of fact, some people actually say that you should use soap and water, that the skin is so tough it doesn't matter, I, I don't know. But anyway, wash it really well, I would suggest organic uh, also. And then uh, you must make sure you dry it really, really well because you certainly don't wanna throw a peel of whatever you're using, orange, lemon, uh, with water droplets on it into uh, hot or warm olive oil. That would not be fun. Oh, I should tell you what happened today at my house when I was making all this stuff. It was pretty funny. So I made all these different things um, today. And at the very end, after I'd finished everything, because we have little paneer, spiced paneer, uh, you know, little paneer balls with herbs that I made. So it's fresh cheese with herbs that substitutes for like meatballs uh, in this pasta, for example. And Christy was cutting those up. And somewhere there are cookies. I don't know where they I'm went. Right Oh, the cookies, right. Yeah, I made, so I made these cookies today. These are, these are the biggest oatmeal cookies I've ever seen. It's gigantic. And um, so 
Uh, that came from the Zingerman's Bakehouse Cookbook, which I've told everyone on the show about a couple times. How are we doing with that pasta? Um, and it's a great cookbook, and I think you're going to enjoy these cookies. Anyway, I made all this stuff. I made the infused oil. I made the, the uh, tomato paste. I, till I taste it, or till it's supposed to be cooked. I set the timer for nine minutes. And what's it, what does it say 12. in first? It says 12. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so we want to make sure that we don't, one thing that is definitely not allowed, in my kitchen anyway, is overdone pasta. So we want to make sure that um, I'm not the person who causes that to happen. Anyway, so I grated all the cheese, I got everything ready. And then the last thing I was going to do, I had cookies in the oven. The last thing I was going to do was to blend up the tomatoes. I took them all out. I scraped the parchment paper so that all the good juices were inside this beautiful thing. And I started doing my stick blender, right? And then something caught my attention. I don't even know what it was. And I said, oh, I dropped my stick blender down. I just left it right there. And I walked away. And as soon as I walked away, of course, what happened? The stick blender weighing quite a bit knocked that over and I just want to tell you I yeah have you ever thought about cleaning your kitchen when this gigantic this was a lot this is thick now because it's been in their fridge but it wasn't thick then and if you can imagine every single nook cranny anywhere so underneath the stove all, underneath the stove, on the wall underneath the stove, stuff everywhere. I mean, it was just chaos. Anyway, I was thrilled that it happened at the end of everything as opposed to in the middle or at the beginning. So I counted that as, as good. Um, whatever. So, uh, so actually, my wife came in at the very end. Uh, she came in 30 seconds after that happened, which was good timing, right? Because then um, she could help clean up. <laughs> but it would have been great if she came in 60 seconds. Yeah, it would have been great if she came in and saw and said, don't do that! <laughs> but she didn't. Anyway, this is ready to go. So I'm going to let you take this, Christy, and dump it into the, um, into the colander and drain it. And we're going to get started cooking this pasta because, I mean, not cooking the pasta, but, but actually getting the pasta ready because it's not going to take very much. So we're going to take a little bit of water, which is somewhere right here. A little bit of, uh, oh yeah, I want pasta water. Uh, you, isn't there any? Not much. Oh, there's probably some. Here, put it down. That's fine. And we'll take a little bit of pasta water. There's plenty. A little bit of pasta water. And we'll put it in the pot. And we'll mix some of our tomato sauce with that. And that'll give it, that starch that's in that pasta water is going to give it a little bit. I'm going to put a little bit more in. That'll give it a nice consistency and also a flavor. And make this go a lot further, too. So that's, that's what we'll do to get that started. And then we're going to put the pasta in as soon as... Christy gives it to me and stir it around and throw the arugula in, throw some Parmigiano or Reggiano in it and we're done, right? So that's how simple it is to make this kind of thing at home. Now, to do some more fun stuff with it though, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to add some Calabrian chilies. Mmm, that's good. Yeah, that's something that you can do. That's nice. Just a little bit. We could add more, but then I'd be mean if I was going to do that. And I don't want to do that. So we're going to add some Calabrian chilies. And we're going to add some capers. Now these capers happen to be capers that were soaked in vinegar. I don't like capers soaked in vinegar. So look for capers that are in salt rather than in vinegar. But unfortunately, there weren't any. So capers. These are all extras. If you didn't have anything, you could do just the tomatoes. Has anybody, has anybody watched... Um, this Netflix series, it's a Danish series, and Rita, right, and Rita, what, if, if you've watched Rita, Rita's favorite food, spaghetti with tomato ketchup, so if you get, get really, 
that's how easy it is to make dinner in Rita's world. So, so that's, that's something that uh, is easy to do. But this is fusilli with concentrated roasted tomatoes and all kinds of little extras that you can or you don't have to add. Where are the olives? We have olives too, right? So we'll put some olives in. Use whatever kind of olives you like. Kalamata olives, green olives. I, I think that with this kind of a dish, because the arugula is assertive, you really need to use olives that have a little bit more flavor. There's like some green olives that I really like, but they're very subtle in flavor. And that's just not going to work with the arugula because it, you're just going to be wasting them, basically. That's, that's, so it's not necessary. I don't think we're going to add any pepper to this because it doesn't seem like it's, it's necessary. And I think we needed a little bit more pasta water, but we don't have it. So we're just going to use what we've got here to make our sauce even just a little bit more saucy. Now, the thing that most people don't know, unless they've spent a lot of time in Italy, is that when you get pasta in most restaurants in the United States, now not in fine restaurants, fine Italian restaurants, there will, all the sauce will be clinging to the pasta. There won't be any sauce at the bottom of the bowl, or if there is any, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. And you can use, you know, your bread to uh, soak that up at the end. It used to be considered gauche, but it isn't anymore. So you do that while it's still not considered gauche, because at some point things go back and it'll be considered gauche again, right? So this pasta will not have, I mean, it's just going to have, the sauce is a condiment. The pasta is the main ingredient. Now, you know, this pasta is okay. It's not, I'm not sure I'd be call it worthy of being the main ingredient, but mm, not bad. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> anyway, yes. So should we put those in? Does anybody have a problem with uh, milk? In other words, paneer? Does anybody have a problem with paneer? Okay, good. Let's, let's do it. Let's put some paneer into this pasta. And that, don't do that with your knife like that. Turn it the other way and do it like that. That's a sin. The paneer, sure, that's, that's really easy. Everybody knows how to make paneer. We've talked about it over and over again. You just take milk and heat it up. Um, medium to medium high. You don't want it to get, you don't want to heat it so it burns in the bottom. Anyway, in a big pot, maybe like this size. And then um, as it begins to boil, it'll start to crawl up the sides. And as it crawls up, the, when it starts to crawl up the sides, then add lemon or yogurt or a combination of yogurt, lemon, uh, whatever. Uh, this is this the simple way to make paneer. There's lots of different ways, but this is the simple way. And then um, it'll start to curdle and you want to get the, the way to essentially be, you know, it'll still be a little cloudy, but it should be fairly, you know, we'll call it cloudy clear. And um, then you can take the paneer and let it sit for a few minutes. I like to let it sit for a few minutes anyway. And then uh, pour it out and put it into a colander, which I do. And I don't, for this particular type of um, item, I don't press it. I just kind of gather it together and I let it drain for a little while. And, and then I just take it and put it in a big mixing bowl with some uh, breadcrumbs, Parmesan cheese, salt, pepper, herbs, and uh, a little bit of olive oil. That's it. And then you just use your hands to make balls. And it usually stays together. <laughs> Usually, um, so it's not, not too bad. So, I mean, I think we're done. That's how simple and easy this dish is to make. And again, it can be, take more time if you want to, um, you know, roast your tomatoes or make paneer. Or, but if you just want to cut up some olives and throw some arugula in and uh, mix it together with some tomato sauce that you whipped up in a few minutes, or if you Rita some ketchup, uh, you can be done really, really quickly. I like to take Parmigiano Reggiano, by the way, only use Parmigiano Reggiano. And if you have the opportunity to use Parmigiano Reggiano that is, you know, at least like 24 months old, at least, I would do that personally because young Parmigiano Reggiano really isn't very interesting, which is what this is, <laughs> unfortunately. So, but 
I like to I like to put Parmigiano Reggiano in, mix it in uh, first, and then I like to put a little bit on top when it comes to time to plate. And Christy's going to plate this and pass it out because you can't wait until the end of the show to eat the pasta. That would be sinful. So she's going to do that, and she's also I'm going to you know normally what I would do is finish this at you know at the plate uh, on your plate with. Um, with a little bit of uh, olive oil drizzled on top, but that's gonna be too hard to do, so we're just gonna put a little bit in now. This is the Meyer lemon infused olive oil, and it should be, make a nice little addition. It'll be really good. And I think it's okay. I didn't, I, I didn't really taste it too much, but Christy, you can taste it and make sure if it needs something else, add it, and put a little bit of Parmigiano Reggiano, sprinkle a little bit on top, okay? So this was one of the pastas that our friend Julia would ask us to make. This type of pasta when when we would cook she she uh what do you need that okay there you go now later on we're going to make a very class a classic pasta there are three or four depends on you know who you are uh, and what you uh you know take as information three or four classic roman pastas there's uh pasta alla amatriciana pasta carbonara and cacio e pepe and we're going to make cacio e pepe because that was one of Julia's favorite pastas. It was one of my, it is one of my favorite pastas. And it uh, was part of a, a little uh, discussion that we had the last time we went out to eat together when we had Cacio e Pepe at a restaurant in September that sparked a long discussion about why would anybody in their right mind serve something like this and call it Cacio e Pepe. <laughs> because that's a classic pasta dish and it's it's so important to the tradition of pasta and it shouldn't be ruined <laughs> so but anyway uh, it, it's it's one of those pasta dishes that's so simple it's very difficult it can be very difficult to make and I have absolutely not I don't make it right I mean I've tried and I continue to try and we'll see what happens tonight uh, at, it'll taste good but it may not be absolutely correct and uh, we'll get more to that story a little bit later I wanted to also uh, take this opportunity because Julia was one of the few people that I and my wife and I have the opportunity to really talk with about food all the time. And she loved food. She loved to talk about food. She loved to criticize the food she was eating. She and uh, a good friend spent uh, quite a number of months going to every steak restaurant in St. Louis trying to f decide what was the best steak in the entire city. Uh, and so obviously a person after my own heart in terms of just uh, the pursuit of food and cooking recipes uh, and just deliciousness. And I, I st started thinking a lot about this and I, I've thought a lot about it prior to the situation, but uh, this spurred me to think even more about it, about how we regard food in our society, what kind of relationship we have to food. How is it? Is it good? Good? I know I, know I can ask Kathleen. It's good? Okay. There's another one I'll have to ask to see if she gives me what she says, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Anyway, good. I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. Um, anyway, the... And I want to preface all, all the remarks that I'm going to make right now by saying this, uh, these remarks have nothing to do with, please do not take them into context if you have, if you're watching, listening here and have a medical condition that requires some type of special diet or, you know, your physician has told you or health practitioner has told you that you need to follow a special diet or anything like this. this is, these are general thoughts that I have about food that I wanted to share with you. Uh, because they're part of uh, my ongoing food journey, I guess you'd say. And uh, I definitely don't want anyone to mistake what I have to say as, as recommending that someone who has a particular health condition abandon their, their uh, <laughs> food needs and uh, start on a different path. Anyway, how many people, uh, just let me see your hands, are, are on a particular diet right now? Well, those of you who are eating, I guess, can only nod your heads, okay? So how many of you are on a particular diet? 
you know? Well, you're, okay, so, well, you're all on a particular diet. Did you, did you know that? Uh, I'm on, I don't know what one you're on. I mean, I'm on the seafood and eat it diet. That's the, that's the one that I'm on. Kathleen's on that one, I know. And, and, but most people, believe it or not, are not on that one. Most people are on either uh, some type of real diet, like for a particular objective, like they want to lose weight. And so they go on a particular diet because they want to lose weight. Or they just follow a particular diet. They, are, they follow a raw food diet. They follow a, a paleo diet. They follow a, a, um, a diet, a keto, is that the name of it? Keto, keto diet. So, so most people are on a diet of some type. And I think that what in our Western culture, what we find is that this whole attitude of uh, food as essentially uh, not an enemy, but not a friend, we'll say, is prevalent. People have a very strange, in general, idea of what part food plays in their lives. And food's part of our emotional makeup from both a mental and physical perspective. It's, it's also what we use to feed our body. I mean, it's what we use to fuel our body every single day. And it's one of the critical and most basic elements that helps determine the flow of our daily activity, whether it's successful, whether it's enjoyable, whether it's easy, our overall sense of well-being, our physical health, all that is based tremendously on what we consume. And most of us have this very complicated relationship with food, and, and yet we don't have any choice but to consume it, right? Because we have to do that in order to, to live. Um, interestingly enough, I thought about it, it's much like love, actually. Um, generally, it's complicated, right? But we pursue it anyway. So what's that? Why, who's beeping? Is somebody beeping? Is it the oven? Is it the stove? Okay, the stove's beeping, so I guess it, f it decided that what I was saying wasn't that interesting and wanted to interrupt me. So I'm going to just turn this on so that we can get other water going here. But really, it is, it is complicated, generally. But love is a nourishing factor in our lives. I think everybody would agree with that. Food also needs to be considered as a nourishing factor in our lives. I'd like to propose something that uh, what some of you may be a totally different way of looking at food. Because there isn't a day that goes by in our Western society, at least, I don't know about other societies, but in our Western society, there isn't a day that goes by that the news isn't filled with the, the newest diet, a better way to lose weight, a different perspective on what is and what isn't good for you to eat, um, what you should consume and not consume. It's endless. It just goes on and on and on. And the other thing is it changes every single day, too. <laughs> it never stays the same. And, and why shouldn't it? It's, a relative it's relative information. And the nature of the relative has changed. So therefore, it's always going to change. So 40 years ago, eggs were great for you. 25 years ago, not so good. Now, great. <laughs> so, butter. Used to be great for you. Nope, margarine is really good for you. Nope, butter is really good for you. Um, it, it just over and over and over, and it gets more complex when you stick with just that whole aspect of fats, because you can just look at you know each different fat. Oh, olive oil is good for you. No, olive oil isn't that good for you. And lard is good for you. No, lard isn't good for you. Um, coconut oil, that's a big one right now, right? Everybody's talking about coconut oil, right? Oh, coconut oil is terrible for you. Now coconut oil is really good for you. No, actually it's not good for you. So it doesn't matter. I, I, what I'm trying to point out is it doesn't matter where you sit in terms of your belief system, if eggs are good, if butter is bad, if margarine's great, if coconut oil is the best oil in the world. Tomorrow the information is going to be different. I mean, that's just it. That's, that's exactly it. And as long as you rely for what you consume on information that comes from the outside, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be confused always. You're going to go from one diet to another diet to another diet because that is just the nature of life. 
you know, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do about that. You're always going to be searching for what's next, what's the best. You know, it's like it's kind of like makeup or shampoo. There's always another one. There's always a better one. You know, right? It's just it's always like that, and it's the same thing. And your body, though, is not really, uh, in my opinion, it, it, it doesn't need to be looked at in the same realm as allowing someone else to tell you what you need. You need to take charge of what you need to consume. And that's the only way you're going to actually be able to really grow on this food journey in a way that has some substance to it that, that will be real. Because the truth is that as long as you rely on that outside information for your nutritive needs, then you'll always be searching. Always. And the key to determining what's nutritious is to know that you're a unique individual with a unique physiology. I mean, that's, this isn't rocket science. I mean, it's just simple. And the only one, the only way to really understand what works for you is to utilize self-referral in your eating. That's it. There, there's, there's really no other way. There's a wealth of information out there and a lot of great information. But the only way you can really use that information is by taking responsibility for yourself, taking responsibility for, you eat, for what you eat, and then sifting all that information through that particular lens. And that will allow you to take responsibility for your own health and really begin to understand what would be best for you to consume. And I, I'm going to use myself as an example. I, I can be an emotional eater. So this is not something that, for me anyway, eating is not something that I always have a handle on. You know, it's a learning experience. It's an ongoing journey. I love it. It's, it's what I do. I, I love to cook. I love to cook for you guys. I love to cook for, for anybody. It's what I can do that makes me feel, you know, like I have some worth a really great self-worth and it's so nice when people are shaking their head going, oh yeah that's good you know that's that's good I love that too and if you didn't I would know you didn't have good taste so it wouldn't matter so but anyway I, I, I can be an emotional eater well what's important then when you take responsibility for your eating when you take that responsibility is the ability to recognize when you're eating from that level when you're eating my I have a my wife is always asking me, you know, what do you want to eat? And I always answer the same thing. I say fried chicken. You know? uh, I, I don't eat fried chicken every day. Matter of fact, I never eat fried chicken. I mean, I rarely eat fried chicken. I'd like to eat it more often. But <laughs> luckily for me, last week I was in St. Louis and I met my mother and my brother and sister-in-law. Uh, we met them at a restaurant after they were almost finished eating, but there was one piece of fried chicken left that my mother hadn't eaten, so I ate it. But, but normally, I don't get that opportunity. Anyway, the, the, the point is, you know, recognizing, you know, what kind of patterns you have, and then being able to explore on this food journey based on those patterns. So the pattern that I'm trying to mention to you, for me, is I need to know, I need to recognize when I'm eating emotionally. And when I can recognize that, then I can stop because it doesn't have any power anymore. You know, that's, it's just simple. It's, it's, it's really, really easy. So that's not to say it isn't fun sometimes to eat emotionally, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing exploration and it won't stop until the body stops. I mean, that's just bottom line. It's a, it's an adventure. I, I think that that's a cool way of looking at eating as an adventure. And it's always changing because, as I said earlier, your physiology is never the same. It's always different. And so it's a challenge from one meal to the next to know. And just because, I'll give you another example. Again, it's easier for me to relate things that happen in my own experience because then I, I know it's real and you can relate then from your own experience on, on whatever level. So last night I had two eggs uh, on top of an English muffin for dinner, right? Sounds good, right? Put a piece of Munster cheese on top of the eggs. That was nice. Buttered the English muffin. Sounded good, and it seemed like it was the right thing to eat. And then afterwards, it didn't feel good. So I was walking by one corner of the kitchen, and I saw this dish of brownies <laughs> that I had made 
<laughs> and I, but, but here was the key point that was really kind of cool, was that I didn't eat, I, I said, hmm. And I took that few seconds of quietness and I thought, I think this might make me feel better. And it, so from that level, I ate two bites of a brownie and I felt better. <laughs> so this is just a, an example of taking the time to really understand what it is you're consuming, how you feel. There's so many different techniques. I mean, you can keep diaries, you can do, you can do so many different things. But the bottom line is really just taking the time to see after you eat, do you feel good? You ate that pasta, you feel good, I hope so. You know, if you feel like you wanna to go to sleep, it's a little different when it's nighttime and you're ready, you know, maybe you wanna to go to sleep because you're tired. But if you eat that pasta for lunch and immediately afterwards you wanna take a nap, that should tell you something because what you consume should give you energy, not, not make you tired and wanna to go to sleep, right? So those are just kind of things. But anyway, to get back to this, the point that I'm making is how can, everybody meet this challenge of trying to get in touch with what they need to essentially be in charge of their own nutrition. It's simply by understanding that love and food are the same, that they both nourish us at the most basic and subtle levels of our nervous system. That's, that's it, you know, food is love. And if you understand that and you eat from that vantage point, you're gonna have a tremendous opportunity to really understand what it is that provides nutrition for your, for you. If we look as food, if we look at food as love, then it becomes something that we need to culture and grow closer to, as opposed to having <laughs> an adversarial relationship with it. <laughs> you know, so it's there. There is just the perspective. If we look at it as something we want to culture then it'll be something that we want to grow closer to because it's love. If we understand that we realize because of the, the fact that everything that we see in this relative creation has a vibratory quality to it, that for optimum mental and physical well-being, we need to consume food that's not only made with love, it's cultivated in love throughout the entire process because that's what we consume then. We consume that love. Now that can become a lot more complicated <laughs> because not all of us have a situation where we're totally in control of everything that we eat, that we have land where we can grow our own food, that we know where the seeds come from and who you know, saved them and, and everything else from seed to table. But the critical element is starting from the realization that the well-known expression, eat what mother gives you, is at its essence saying that food is an expression of love and at its highest value when it's created, prepared, and consumed from that level of consciousness, then food has its most nutritive quality. So if we just understand that, we're already, you know, we've taken a step, a big step, I think, to making us in more, to allow us to be more nurtured by the food that we consume. A lot of us, have to go to restaurants to eat sometimes. Some of us go to restaurants because we like to go to restaurants, but some of us, you know, go to restaurants because we just, you know, it's the time, you know, we're, we have a job that doesn't allow us to, situation, we have a meeting, we have to go out, you know. So then, as I said, it becomes a little bit more complicated, all these things in terms of being able to consume things in, in love, uh, things that are created in love and that uh, are, uh, have love at, at their essence. But, it's kind of fun, actually, as part of this adventure to find where that exists in the public, where that exists in restaurant culture. It's really fun. And f over the years, those are the places that I go to. I go to places where I know and can see there's this tremendous love that radiates from whatever. Maybe it's just the staff, because that's, those are the only people I've come into contact with. But that's, in and of itself, an expression of the ownership of that particular spot. So there's a there's a restaurant in, in Las Vegas called District One. It's a Vietnamese restaurant. 
And the staff there is like, you've never seen anything like it, or at least I never experienced anything like it. They're hugging each other all the time, and they're just like, you know, smiling, and they're so effusive in their behavior with each other. And I mentioned it to someone else, and they said, oh, yeah, somebody in the restaurant business in Las Vegas, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's how they are. They're just amazing. It's just like one big family. You know? Well, I want to eat there, right? I mean, I want to eat there because that reflects on the kind of food that, that's going to be there. Um, I have another friend who, when she was a chef, she didn't allow any talking in her kitchen. Nothing. It had to be totally silent. Wow. That's, th her food was powerful. And that's great. I mean, I've had another experience where I was eating at a restaurant in New York, and I went to the bathroom, and I could hear whoever in the kitchen screaming at each other. I never went back there again, you know, because... That's what you're imbibing, right? You're imbibing that anger that at some point, whatever food you're, you're eating, that's what, that's what part of the qualities of that food. So there's a guy who has a place in St. Louis. His, his name is Brian. I, I know that can't be his real name because he's Thai, but uh, a lot of people do that. You know, did you ever, have you noticed that when you get the solicitation calls, right? And you know that somebody's like in India or Pakistan or China or whatever, and they have like Alan. Hi, my name's Alan. You know, what? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he says his name's Brian. Okay, who am I to argue with that? Anyway, when you walk into his restaurant, this guy is like the smile is pouring off of him. You know, every time I've ever walked in there, it's just pouring off of him. And there's only two people in that kitchen. Mostly it's just him by himself. And other than that, it's his wife who also has a smile that's pouring over her. And it's like... Oh, I want to eat there, you know, because that's what they're putting into the food. That's, it's hard enough to be, to get new, <laughs> nutrition from eating out. But if you at least can go somewhere where they're pouring their love into whatever they do, because that's what they really, really, that's who they are. And they also care. There can be varying degrees of that, too. They could be that and they could be opening cans, right, too. Well, that makes it, you know, it may not be as quite as great an experience, but luckily, these guys don't, you know, they, they do open cans of, of coconut milk, but, <laughs> but, 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 but you understand, I know that those of you listening, watching, whatever, understand what I'm saying, you know, those are the kind of places you want to seek out. There's a place in, there's a, there's so many different restaurants, you know, like one of the best ways to see what's going on in a restaurant is to go to restaurants where they have open kitchens, because when you have an open kitchen, it's really tough to hide. It's really, so sit right there if you can. Sit in front of that window. Sit at the bar if they have the kitchen counter and watch what goes on. And if you see that everybody is focused, quiet, and also enjoying themselves, you're gonna eat, you want to eat there. Go back because it's a tremendous experience. Uh, it will be a tremendous experience. And I know I have places like that. You know, where I just go over and over. Some people say to me, why do you go to the same places over and over again? I don't go to the same places over and over again, but I like to seek out these types of places, and especially then when the experience is so amazing, which, which it will be for the most part, um, I like to go back because they have, if the people are happy, you know, then there's a lot of other things that have gone on behind the scenes that make that, work like for example this one restaurant i'm thinking of you know on their on their menu it says um we've added two percent to your bill um and we've contributed x percent so that all of our employees can have tremendous health benefits and they never have to worry about you know come on i mean i want to go there right this also happens to be a place with an open kitchen where you can watch everybody really enjoying themselves and being happy in what they're doing and so it's fantastic. Anyway, so those are, those are just some of the thoughts that, that I wanted to share with you because uh, it's, it's part of what I see as uh, really critical because I really think that most of us have given over that responsibility for our nutrition to somebody else or other people, other things, other thoughts and ideas. And that doesn't mean that those thoughts and ideas and philosophies and eating methods aren't good and don't have value doesn't have anything to do with that, because mo many of them do, I'm sure. It has to do with just that before that, you are the only one that can really decide what works for you. You're the only one that needs to be responsible. You're, you're the one that needs to be responsible to take whatever information 
and see how you can integrate it into yourself. Because every time you sit down to eat, your physiology is different. So what can you do? There are all kinds of different things. People, last month when Dinesh Gewali was here, he said, you know, eat in quiet, eat in a you know, nice atmosphere, prepare your food in a nice atmosphere, sip a little bit of hot water. You know, these are all practical things that you can do when you eat. Don't have your computer on and doing emails while you're, ah. <laughs> it's okay, I, I've been there. I, I am now, but you know, we all, again, it's all individual, it's all unique. You have to find out what works for you, right? For me, the only way I could, at least at this moment now, say that I don't do that is I had to kind of do more. I had to stop listening to the news. I had to stop, you know, looking for that next story. I had to, and, and by doing all that, then I also... I don't open my emails until after I ate breakfast. You know, all those things had to go on in order for me to put that technology away. And wow, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's a different life. <laughs> and, and I think that a lot of people have experienced that before because there's been plenty written about, you know, moving away from technology at certain times. And when you eat, it's really a great opportunity to just be with, you know, yourself, or be with a companion, or be with your family, or, or whatever. <sighs> so, I think that was maybe about all I wanted to say in that regard mm -hmm. at this moment. But there might be other things as, as time goes on. But one thing you can do, this is something that I learned uh, many, many years ago, and I may not have the, the correct technique. And this was something that, that uh, again, this isn't my... It's just uh, something that I, that I read. And that is one of the things that you can do practically, because there's all kinds of practical things that you can do to try to be more in tune with what it is that you need to eat, is you can actually you know, think about, you, know, you can put your hand right on your stomach and just think, you know, do I, oh, hey, how does cottage cheese feel? You know, you know how, how does that egg feel? How does Steve's pasta feel? You know, and, and you can go by that, you know, by just being in a quiet place and just kind of seeing. You know, what, is that, what does it feel like? And you'll be, I think you'll be, if you haven't done it before, I think you'll be surprised to see that it's very interesting. One time I went through a whole bunch of foods and couldn't find anything that, I, that worked. <laughs> so eventually I just ate something, because, but anyway. Not even the brownies. Yeah, it wasn't, it, that was really, that brownie experience though, that was really cool. It was very, very interesting because it's kind of like, it reminded me of how you see a dog go out and eat you know, grass when it needs something. Not that I was comparing myself to that, but. <laughs> Whatever. All right. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's enough. Okay, so the next live show, by the way, is going to be on uh, March the 6th. And as Julie informed me, that is a Tuesday. So <laughs> uh, the first Tuesday of March, March the 6th. And our guest is not yet uh, established, but I'm hoping it's going to be uh, Mary Adam, who has cooked on the show before, and she's uh, a great home cook, and uh, looking forward to that. She's either going to be here in March or April. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, another thing I want to mention is that for quite a long period of time, how long? I don't know. Julie Stumal has been helping us out every first Tuesday here at um, this place, and so I want to thank you again, as always, you know, for that. And I want to thank Green Building Supply for hosting us every Tuesday, every first Tuesday, and for Fairfield Media Center for coming along. And, of course, the broadcast of the show, you can see, if you're not watching the live stream uh, live, you can see it on Fairfield Media Center's YouTube channel, usually posted in a day or two afterwards. And so all you have to do is go to fairfieldmediacenter.com and go down to live events, I think. And then if you go there, you'll find the Great Taste uh, live event. And that'll lead you, I think, to the Great Taste YouTube channel eventually, right? Probably? No, it won't. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I think maybe further down, there's a list of YouTube channels. Yes, that's it. Okay. Further down, there's a list of YouTube channels, and you can find that. And, uh, of course, the broadcast on Crew, KRUU 100.1 FM, is on Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Fridays at 9 a.m. No, 7 a.m., sorry. And as uh, many of you may know, Crew is, uh, is uh, no longer going to be on the air as of the beginning of March. And I'm happy to say that through the invitation of Fairfield Media Center, uh, Great Taste will be continuing here and also the regular weekly show in audio format on uh, Fairfield Media Center's uh, website. And very excited about that and got a lot of great 
books and authors and journalists and other people to introduce you to uh, over as time goes on. And maybe you have to listen to me even more uh, talk, talk about all this kinds of stuff. Anyway, so, oh yeah, there's a great, there, you should, you liked Maggie's, didn't you? Maggie's wood fired, Maggie's farm, wood fired pizza, right. There's a great new place in Iowa City, Maggie's farm, wood fired pizza. And they fit into this because I watched these guys for 20 minutes working out what was going on with their pizza oven in terms of the temperature and everything. And it was f fascinating because it just showed how much attention to detail, you know, was, okay, put it here, put it here, put it here, throwing, using the laser, you know, to see what the temperatures were and all the different spaces, trying to figure out how to get that crust. Absolutely perfect. And so, um, yeah, great, great uh, new, new addition to, to the local uh, food scene. And uh, I had, uh, the salad I had there was great too. And this isn't even salad season. And the soup, huh? And they love what they do. Yeah, and they love what they do. That's exactly right. And they're on Melrose, uh, right near the f football stadium. Beautiful. And when you go there, you see the care and detail that went into actually creating that place. It's beautiful. I mean, the, 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 it's beautiful. It's really well done. It's, it's a modern motif, but it's just really well done. Really great. So I'm glad we, because they fit into this, this whole thing. And some of the people that work there, it's kind of funny because one of the guys who works there used to own the Motley Cow. And, and uh, another guy who works there used to be uh, one of the top pizza Yolo at uh, Pizza Yolo at uh, Lincoln Wine Bar and also has a farm where uh, they're doing all kinds of stuff uh, that we'll talk more about in the spring. And hopefully they'll be down here to do a show. Uh, the guys uh, in Iowa City who have this fantastic farm. Anyway, another pasta, cacio e pepe. Really, as I said, really simple, exceedingly difficult to make. If you get it in a restaurant and it's right, you'll constantly be going back there. What I like to do is when I go to a place and it's on the menu, I always order it, always. Because if they can make that right, I know I'm in the right spot, and mostly they can't. Uh, so, so, so that's the way it goes. Uh, and so in September, uh, Julia and her parents and my wife and I went to this restaurant uh, in St. Louis, and we ordered, that was one of the things we ordered was cacio e pepe, and you know, they make their own pasta. So you, we were thinking, oh yeah, this is really, and you know, it's, there's an Italian woman who's there and all this stuff. and. Uh, so one of the things that, again, one of the interactions with Julia that I always loved was that we could sit there and, you know, really criticize the food that we were eating. And so we did that quite a bit with that cacio e pepe because it was a travesty. And so I promised her at that time, because we were going to Italy the following month, and I promised her, I said, okay, I'm going to learn how to make cacio e pepe. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to cook it for you. And this is how one of those beautiful little things that, you know, how nature unfolds things. We were in Torino and uh, we were seeing some friends from Rome who happened to be there and we were having breakfast with them. And I said to my friend Francesco, I said, so what are you cooking? Because he's a great cook. His wife's a great cook too, both home cooks. And what did he answer? Cacio e pepe. It was it was incredible. I mean, it was just like, oh my gosh, you know, and he proceeded to dig out his notebook from his backpack and draw in detail how I needed to make cacio e pepe and pff, complete instructions. And then when he and his wife got back to their home after a couple of weeks, they were on the road, he sent seven videos of how to make cacio e pepe. And uh, you'd all get a kick out of one of them because he, as he, he put the pasta in, then he lit a cigarette. And he said, when this is done, the pasta will be ready. To put. So I said, I sent, I, sent a, I sent a note to him. I said, well, what if you don't smoke? And he said, well, how about a cigar? Said, <laughs> but anyway, the, the point is that that, pot, that cigarette, you know, is only lit long enough 
so that that pasta still has several minutes to cook and it's got to go back into the into the pot, right? Into the it's got to come out of the pot and go into the pan. And we're going to do that unfortunately time is what it is. It's going to be off air probably when we get to that, uh, which probably is good for me because then I won't embarrass myself as much uh, actually on camera. So and you guys I know will keep everything confidential if things don't turn out right, right? Of course, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so if you look, though, I think this is interesting. If you look at the recipes that you can find online for cacio e pepe, what you'll see is that most all of them use ingredients that are not part of the original or what people say is the original recipe for cacio e pepe. Cacio e pepe has water, pepper, fresh ground pepper, pecorino romano, and pasta. That's it. That's it. Nothing else. So recipes will add butter, recipes will add olive oil, recipes will add Parmigiano Reggiano, and I'm sure there must be other stuff too. Um, but those are the main ingredients that they would they will add to change the recipe. And I, I find it interesting because I don't have anything against change. I think it's great to 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 mess with things and to make them your own and to try to. But but I do. Love, just like pesto, if you're going to make pesto, a classic Genovese pesto, make it according to the traditional recipe. And then, if you want to do something else, do it. But make sure you say, I, did, I added butter to it, along with the olive oil, or whatever. You know? Because I think that there's some value to tradition. There's a value to knowing where things come from, and knowing the history that's behind them. And so, Cacio e Pepe is water, pasta. Pepper, fresh ground, pecorino romano. Now, one reason that I know for a fact that people use Parmigiano Reggiano is because it's not easy to find really good pecorino romano. Most pecorino romano is not really pecorino romano that you can buy in the stores in the United States. It's made in Sardinia. It's so salty you can't even eat it for the most part. And so they cut it with Parmigiano Reggiano because that way it mellows it out a little bit more. But if you get a really good Pecorino Romano, like this was in its whole form before I graded it earlier today, because I was able to go to DePaulo's in New York and oh. say to Lou DePaulo, I need a Pecorino Romano to make cacio e pepe for my friend who I promised I could make really good cacio e pepe, I would try to make really good cacio e pepe for, and he said, I have exactly the right Pecorino Romano for you. And I think, this, I'm going to say, I think it was 21 months, but I can't remember for sure. But Pecorino Romano is a sheep cheese made in Lazio, which is where Rome is. It's not made in Sardinia or some other place. And it certainly should be able to be eaten without needing to get a big glass of water, you know, to, to eat along with it. So I think you're going to find that it'll be really interesting. But I just am so marveled at how nature made this work, too, for me, so that I don't have to do this on camera. <laughs> So, does anybody have any questions really quick? Because we have about one minute before we have to go out and uh, I get to make this for all of you. The, the real key to it is, according to my friend, Francesco, is, so that everybody knows, is that you take the pasta out before, and, and classically, there's several pastas, but spaghetti is one, and the Checo happens to be a really good, steady, good brand that's easily available for everybody. You take the pasta out several minutes ahead of time uh, before it's al dente. In a pot, you will have just a tiny bit of water and you will have grated you know, ground pepper into that water and you'll start to heat it. And the floral smell from that is quite astounding. You should just do it at home just for fun because it was like the first time that happened when I put my nose over that pepper in the water, it was like, whoa. It opened up a whole new world to me. Then you're going to take that pasta uh, when it still has a couple minutes left and you're going to put it into that peppered water and you're going to cook it the rest of the way. There's just a tiny bit. There's not hardly anything. If you need to, you can add a little bit more. And then when the pasta is al dente, then you're going to take it off the heat, very important, and you're going to add your cheese and you're going to keep moving it around. Some people do it violently, some people do it slowly, but you want that cheese, and you can add a little bit more water, more water if you need to, you want that cheese to actually just melt into the pasta. You don't want globs. That's what I end up with too many times. You don't want any globs. You want it nice and smooth and wonderful. Okay, so we're going to do that, and nobody's going to tell. 
right? You've been listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. You've been watching Great Taste maybe on live stream or on the FMC YouTube channel. Uh, I'm Steve Boss, your host every week for 60 minutes of delicious radio on crew right now and soon to be on the FMC Fairfield Media Center dot com. Test. Sweet. Sour. So good to test. <laughs>